The EU has its eyes on Warsaw, the upcoming election, and the future of the Polish media. A story in the New York Times has an impact in New Delhi. Indian journalists are rounded up as a result. And museums as casualties of war, the one Russia is waging against Ukraine's heritage and history. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we don't cover the news, we cover the way the news is covered. When a country falls victim to state capture and the powers that be team up with influential business interests to manipulate its politics, seldom is that more evident than during an election campaign, such as the one that Poland is experiencing now. The country goes to the polls on Sunday, October 15th, with the current coalition government, led by the Law and Justice Party, known by its Polish acronym, PiS, fighting off an opposition group called the Civic Coalition. PiS has been in power since 2015. It quickly tamed independent voices at state-owned media, particularly at the public broadcaster, TVP. Scores of privately owned news outlets then ended up in the hands of government-allied corporate players and underwent similar editorial transformations. There is a lot riding on this vote, and not just for Poland. There are cracks in its relationship with the EU, growing tensions between Poles and their neighbors in Ukraine, and the nationalist, anti-EU, anti-immigrant position that peace has taken, some of that has been adopted by its rivals for power. It could be here to stay. You can say that the Polish election is free. Is it fair? That's much less clear. If you listen to the, the way that the anchors frame the debate, they basically hammer at the opposition as being disloyal to Poland. And not a one-time thing, it, it happens every night. Last Sunday being a case in point, a huge anti-government pre-election protest in Warsaw won the opposition alliance called the March of a Million Hearts, although estimates have the turnout at up to 800,000. The publicly funded state-controlled broadcaster, TVP, fails to cover the story live, then buries it on its newscasts and puts the number of protesters at just 160,000. That figure was strikingly low. It also happens to be the number the ruling party put out there. Here uh, lies the connection between the party line and the editorial line at the so-called public TV. TVP has uh, quickly jumped into line, undermining the opposition uh, narrative and definitely not reporting anything close to independent journalism. Uh, we can clearly say that the TVP is an instrument in the hands of the party. All of Warsaw was affected. They didn't quite have the nerve to say it didn't happen, but what they say, it wasn't really relevant. And that does disadvantage the opposition because they really have to depend upon their own access to IT platforms to disseminate their own program. There was a great imbalance between how the public television and how non-public television channels broadcast this event. Policja doliczyła się 100 tysięcy osób. Stołeczny ratusz miliona. TVP is not about credibility anymore. It's about what the government is politically finding important. The current government in Warsaw is led by Jarosław Kaczynski's Law and Justice Party, known in Poland as PiS. It's up against an opposition coalition of parties and a former prime minister turned TVP target, Donald Tusk. When peace took power in 2015, it quickly eradicated the independence of TVP, firing all its journalists, making them reapply for their jobs and hiring back only party loyalists. Many privately owned news outlets that had been independent then got bought by companies associated with peace and changed their editorial tune accordingly. The European Union raised its concerns about press freedom in Poland. Then, in 2019, it saw peace go after the justice system, dismissing judges it disapproved of. 
Four months ago, the European Court of Justice ruled those judicial changes illegal under EU law. And Brussels is now withholding billions of euros in transfer payments to Warsaw. Peace's politicians, backed by TVP and other news outlets, routinely go after EU bodies like the European Council, which used to be led by Donald Tusk. They take historical memory in Poland and tamper with it, describing Brussels as the new Berlin or Moscow, just another foreign capital out to steal Poland's independence. The European Union has a frozen payment of billions of euros in COVID recovery funds for Poland over concerns that Poland is backsliding on democracy and rule of law. Uh, obviously the government sees this as an attack and because Donald Tusk and the opposition is uh, generally much more pro-EU, law and justice uh, attacks them for being, uh, for being disloyal to Poland, for being the lackeys of Eurocrats in, uh, in Brussels. Polish TV not only replicates uh, the narrative that Donald Tusk is a German stooge, but they also at the same time accuse him of being uh, Vladimir Putin ally. Kiedy Tusk stał na czele rządu w Polsce, rosyjskie media pisały o nim nasz człowiek w Warszawie. The PIS government is using taxpayer money to turn the public TV into uh, its own version of a Fox News channel it does not give a fair chance to the opposition. PIS has tilted the playing field for its favor, but uh, the society in Poland overall is not as stupid as the uh, PIS government would uh, want them to be. But is it as xenophobic, as racist? Back in 2015, when peace was elected, its anti-immigration stance was central to the party's messaging. Its insistence that Poland is a Christian country, that outsiders such as Muslims represent a threat. Peace then rolled out the welcome mat for Ukrainian refugees, white ones, Christians, 1.5 million of whom remain in Poland. And while the party's patience for Ukrainians is clearly wearing out, it saves its ugliest race-based rhetoric for the relatively few Muslims who dare show up at Poland's borders. It is the kind of rhetoric that Donald Tusk and the opposition alliance are now dabbling in as well. So it's not just going out on TVP and pro-government news outlets, it's everywhere. The racist right-wing nationalist uh, uh, narrative, which used to be all about Jews being enemies of Polish identity, has now shifted towards presenting Muslims as enemies. That it's the duty of the government to defend Polish women against rape, against these people flooding in and taking everything. This is a new narrative and it's a low point. It historically doesn't make sense. And of course, there's no validity in terms of any uh, figures that would suggest criminality on the part of the few people who have passed through Poland or have settled in Poland. This is extremely successful in instrumenting terrorist attacks in France or in the UK. And it's not happening to us here. It's thanks to our immigration policies, but then uh, at the end of the day, both of Tusk and Mr. Kaczynski, they're both aware that even if the electorate is not saying that out loud, in general, Polish people are fearful for illegal migration. A fear reflected in, more like affected by, the treatment certain immigrants get on TVP and news outlets in that camp. Poles fought hard to win freedom of the press. In the 1980s, their labor movement, Solidarity, led the resistance in Warsaw Pact countries against Soviet rule. And Poles paid the price for that. Martial law was imposed. Thousands were jailed without trial. And when the Soviet Union collapsed, taking news sources like TASS and Pravda with it, 
polls got the credit they deserved. Since 2015, however, they have squandered some of the freedoms they gained. TVP is no tax or profit, but nor is it what Solidarity had in mind 40 years ago, when so many polls put it all on the line. Journalists who do as they are told, instinctively. It's not that the state media waits for a minister to say something against uh, Tusk or the opposition and then leaps on it. They're doing the attacks themselves. So I don't think you can say that the media apparatus amplifies. It is the propaganda arm of the government. And this is a really important election in Europe. It will have an impact on how Poland continues its relationship with Brussels. What does it say about the rise of more populist, far-right uh, governments in Hungary, now in Slovakia, in Italy? If Poland continues in the same trend, what does that mean for EU unity? There's a lot at stake uh, in this election. Indian police raided the offices of a news website in the capital this past week, arresting journalists there over accusations that their outlet spreads Chinese propaganda. Johanna Hus is here with more. Richard, the action in Delhi taken against journalists working for NewsClick is seen by rights groups as an escalation by the authorities against media outlets they find inconvenient. At least 30 locations linked to the website, including offices and the homes of journalists, were raided and NewsClick's founder, Prabir Purkayasta, as well as dozens of other staffers, were taken in for questioning. Indian officials say they are investigating allegations that NewsClick is being funded by pro-China elements to spread Chinese propaganda. These allegations have been denied by the website. The Indian government, however, got that idea from a New York Times article published two months ago, which alleged that NewsClick is financially backed by American millionaire Neville Roy Singham, who is reported to have close ties to the Chinese government. Tensions between India and China have been escalating. There are disputes over their shared Himalayan border. And shortly after the New York Times report, a case was registered against NewsClick under India's Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, UAPA, an oppressive anti-terror law. Media advocacy groups in India have highlighted the hypocrisy of New Delhi's position. Government officials routinely protest and denounce critical journalism by international outlets like the New York Times, calling them motivated and fake. So the seriousness with which they have followed up on the revelations in this report is in contrast with how dismissive they've been before. Thanks, Joe. A year and a half ago in Ukraine, just after Russia's invasion, museum workers there scrambled to protect their collections from getting ransacked. They knew the Russians were coming for museum collections in the southeastern part of the country. Museums help us understand the past to make sense of the present. The theft and deliberate destruction of cultural heritage has become a feature of conflicts around the world in places like Syria and Iraq. In Ukraine, Russian forces have been methodical. When armed men in uniform started showing up at museums, they knew what they were looking for. And the targeting of Ukrainian heritage fits right in with Vladimir Putin's view of Ukraine's identity and its history, his rejection of its right to exist. The Listening Post's Tarek Nafa now on a war on culture designed to rewrite history and weaken Ukrainian resistance. March 2022, Melitopol's Museum of Local History, southeastern Ukraine the first target in a Russian looting spree that began just weeks after the invasion. As the Russians take the city, museum director Leila Brahimova buries a priceless collection of Scythian gold deep in a cellar, somewhere she hopes occupying forces won't find it. The next day, the Russians came for her. Uh, they put a hood on her head. Uh, they took her, in Ukraine, they call it Padval. It's a basement where they just lock you up and they torture you. They wanted to know where the collection was. The only thing they underestimated was her character. And uh, when they put a gun to her head, she said, I'm not afraid of you. No, I'm not afraid to die. Um, I'm sorry. 
Now she's in a safe place, but her family is not safe, so she cannot uh, talk about it. They target museum workers and museum directors specifically because they are leaders for their community. And when they cannot uh, get them to collaborate, then they persecute them. Of course, Leila Ibrahimova did not uh, let the occupiers know where collection is, but later some people with special equipment came and in the basement they found the collection and uh, they uh, launched a kind of a propaganda campaign which was widely disseminated through Russian propaganda channels showing the newly appointed director who is Ukrainian telling that look this collection was attempted to be looted by previous museum leadership. But luckily, thanks to Russia occupation, these collections are being preserved. The same week, a group of men turned up at the local history museum in occupied Mariupol, looking for the famous works of Mariupol-born artist Archip Kuinji, who many Russians claim as their own. Among the intruders, pro-Kremlin TV anchor Alexander Mozgovoy. В этот раз прибыли в Мариуполь, если можно так выразиться, целым культурно-информационным десантом. Mozgovoy questioned the museum's director Natalia Kapasnokova on camera. Ничего не не удалось. Самая наша большая драгоценность это оригинал работы Коинжи. Мы его спасли. Он сейчас находится в тайном таком месте. Off camera. The TV anchor says the director revealed the location of her secret collection, her home. Footage eventually emerged of masked men loading the collection into minivans. And a picture was posted by Mozgovoy, holding Quinji's red sunset on the Dnipro. Then the focus turned to the city of Kherson and what would become the occupying force's biggest heist yet. When the Russians first arrived at the Kherson Regional Art Museum, Museum director Alina Dotsenko told them her collection had been relocated. Initially, that satisfied them. Dotsenko says the artworks would have remained hidden if members of her staff hadn't given them up. I knew there were Russian collaborators in the team. They were obvious, and they'd really made themselves known since 2014. I caught them, and they promised that they wouldn't do it again, that they changed, but that wasn't true. They hadn't. In May 2022, Dotsenko faced intense pressure from Russian authorities. She was summoned to a commander's office and, fearing the fate of other museum directors, fled Kherson. On July 19th, Russian police and intelligence officers moved on the museum. On that day, six armed men went through the building. They were wearing masks. With them was Natalia Desyatova, a local singer, who introduced herself as the new museum director. They also brought one of their collaborators, Natalia Koltsova. They took the keys, opened up the locker, and everyone saw the collection right there. And the collaborators shouted, see, we've been telling you for the last six months, the collection hasn't been moved. The director and her staff are lying. We will run the museum with you, under Russian governance. We've been waiting for you. When the Ukrainian troops closed in to take back her son, the Russians started moving the collection out of the museum. Some of the pieces were treated with care, but others were just thrown in. We can identify the paintings, because every painting has a number at the back. As the Russians retreated from Kherson, they emptied the city's museums of around 15,000 pieces of art. Photos have since emerged of dozens of pieces from the collection in a museum in Russian-occupied Simferopol, Crimea. There is nothing random about how the looting unfolded. Human rights groups say the organized operation to rob Ukrainians of their national heritage amounts to a war crime. For the people tasked with protecting that heritage, Ukraine's museum workers, it constitutes an attack on Ukrainian identity. Anything that can be associated with Russian culture has been looted. 
But dozens of museums, archives and other cultural sites have also been intentionally damaged or destroyed. Putin, he is destroying and targeting what he cannot associate with the Russian culture. For example, uh, right behind me, those are the artifacts uh, from the Ivankiv Museum of Local Lore. It was the first museum that was actually precisely uh, hit by Russian missile. And it had a great collection of artworks by Maria Primachenko, a very widely known uh, Ukrainian naive painter who absorbed Ukrainian tradition into her artwork. They targeted that museum. And those artists and their artworks are very connected to real Ukrainian identity were neglected or imprisoned in Soviet times. International monitoring satellite laboratories prove that no other building was hit, so it was intentionally damaged. Putin on the 21st of February clearly declared that Ukrainian cultural heritage it's something which belongs to Russia. And uh, by attacking our cultural heritage, they attack our national identity, trying to just clean up everything which is connected to us as Ukrainians. <laughs> Vladimir Putin has repeatedly dismissed Ukraine's history and trivialized the idea of a distinct Ukrainian identity separate from Russia. Ukrainians see continuity with episodes from Russia's imperial past, the push in the 18th and 19th century to suppress the Ukrainian language, or later, in Soviet Russia, the mass targeting of Ukraine's cultural leaders, historians and writers. In the here and now, Ukraine's heritage is a justification for the war and a target of Russian forces which makes protecting that heritage an existential issue for Ukrainian culture, a matter of survival. They started the war because of our cultural identity. They want to erase it. What they cannot possess, they want to erase. How dare you have a different cultural identity? And all our cultural heritage, it proves that we are different. This is a heritage war, this is identity war. And Putin really tries to destroy Ukrainian nation, and one of the main issues is, of course, our cultural identity. Cultural heritage and the long centuries history of Ukraine, this, this are, these are things which kept Ukrainians as Ukrainian for centuries, which makes us much stronger, which makes us feel as we are a community which differs from Russians. And this is the most dangerous to Putin. And finally, watching Russian TV these days can be like taking a trip to another world, a place utterly detached from any criticism of the war, sorry, military offensive in Ukraine. A world where TV hosts like Sergei Mardan on Rossiya One see the inevitable return of the Russian Empire. Mardan says that vision came to him on the very same day that President Putin recently announced a new holiday, the Day of Unification, it will be marked every September 30th. That's the anniversary of last year's Russian annexation of four regions of Ukraine. Now, according to Mardan, there will be new additions, new territories and people to that list every year. And that's reason to celebrate. It's all part of the Russian media's ongoing propaganda war. Again, sorry, information offensive over Ukraine. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Дальше, через год, через пять, через десять лет будем отмечать этот день, когда мы 30 сентября, ну, я надеюсь, где-нибудь там на Ленгарах, и не только, будут праздничные салюты. А вот перечисляя новые русские области, Донецк, Луганск, Запорожье, Херсон. Мы продолжим этот список. Я, правда, на это очень рассчитываю и очень в это верю. И, по крайней мере, вот судя по совершенно бешеной реакции и либеральных пабликов, и пабликов, которые делают всякие разные политические хохлы, я понимаю, что здесь в точку это очень больно, а значит, очень верно. Создание русского государства, речь идет о воссоздании Российской империи. Вот про что праздник 30 сентября. Страшный праздник. Не для нас. Для нас 
светлый праздник, долгожданный. 